Hello and welcome aboard the Cross Point Community Church, also known as CCC. I'm Flight Attendant Poe. And I'm Flight Attendant Grayson. And I'm Flight Attendant Conrad. And this is what you need to know aboard the CCC. If it's your first time worshiping with us, we want our passengers to know that our mission here is to lead people to be passionate followers of Christ. If you have noticed the two boxes located at our two exit points, to the left and right of the gym, that is TOM, stands for Ties, Offerings, and Missions, and this is how we take offering aboard the CCC. If you will take the time to turn into your bulletins, you will notice that kids stuff is coming up soon. On May 6th, we will have kid stuff, and we will talk about responsibility. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy this promo video. If you don't go to the May Kid Stuff, you won't learn about responsibility. If you don't learn about responsibility, you'll make bad decisions like going to midnight movies. When you go to midnight movies, you skip school. When you skip school, you get F's in school. When you get F's in school, you fail out. When you fail out, you have trouble getting a job. When you have trouble getting a job, you end up cleaning toilets. When you end up cleaning toilets, you might get diarrhea in your face. Don't get diarrhea in your face. Go to the May Kid Stuff and learn about responsibility. Hey, do you know what it means to be saved? No. You know what baptism is? Well, if you have any questions like these two, We Believe class will start right after the 1045 service next week. What We Believe class is, is basically giving a rundown on what it's like to become saved, or what it is to become baptized. So, it's for all ages, and if you want to get baptized, this is a class for you. Tonight is Student Takeover. We take off with our new series called Pause. In the first week, we're going to be looking at our relationship with God and how it's being distracted by all the stuff that's going on in our lives. Sometimes we feel that our relationship is getting more distant, but really it's not God getting distant with us, it's us getting distant with God. So, come back for games, worship, pizza, and most importantly, small groups, where we take a look more in depth. Today we take off with our new series, Baggage Claim. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about the issues in our past and how they affect us today, and how to move past them. So fasten your seatbelts as we take off for part one, Unchecked Baggage. Today our flight will be roughly an hour and five minutes long. Um, the weather forecast for today, sunny, and room temperature. We'll be flying at an altitude of almost heavenly. So, if you have any questions after the service, stop by the welcome table or visit our website, crosspointonline.net. Now, here's a brief recap of your in flight info. Good morning. Welcome to Cross Point Community Church. And I need to take a moment to say this. Um, home of the 2012 Mason County Prom Queen, Miss Taryn Maines. <laughs> we are so proud of you, Taryn. My name is Kim Skaggs, and I am Kid XP Director here at Cross Point. Um, we serve children nursery through grade five. If you um, would like to serve in that area or you just have questions for me, I'm always hanging out in the back there before second service and after. So just come see me if you have any questions or would like to serve. If you're a first time guest, we would like you to go to the welcome table after service. Um, you'll receive a free gift and we would like to have a chance to meet you. Um, next week, we believe we'll be going on in the library after second service. This is for all ages, and it's kind of the next step of faith. So if you feel like you need to go to that, if you've never been baptized, this is the place for you. 
um, today, new series, Baggage Claim. Um, so be ready for Kevin to bring that message to you here in just a few minutes. Um, if you would, stand, shake hands, chest bump, give a fist, whatever it takes to make someone feel welcome. Okay, I'm ready to go. All right, where's your baggage? Oh, me? I don't have any baggage. Really? Yes, really. Come on, I'm in a hurry. I've got to get going. Well, all your baggage has to be labeled or, or you're not allowed on board. Well, I just told you, I don't have any baggage. Just this one, and it's not very big. Well, that's baggage, and, and it has to be labeled, or, or you can't take it on. So you're telling me that I have to have my baggage labeled, or I can't go on. This is a waste of time. I'm going to be late. That's what I've been saying. So everyone's got baggage, even them. Even them. Well, we better hurry up and get these luggage tags passed out to him so I can get going. Don't miss anybody out there. Make sure you get them all. Susan Carlisle, I bet she's got some baggage up there. She needs one of those tags. Don't miss her. Mm. Kelly Ferris, don't miss him. I know he's got baggage. Krista Coleman, yeah, don't miss her. Oh, Jen Boone, we know she's got baggage. Get her. Oh, we got Angie Paver hiding up there in the top. Make sure you get her. I know she's got baggage. She goes to Zumba with me. Let's see, who else? Hmm. Got everybody out there? Still have some people. People hiding up in the top. They don't think they have any baggage either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> got them all up there trying to sleep. They got baggage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see them. Mm -hmm. They get Kevin Carpenter. They get him. All right. Hmm. Well, now that you've wasted my time and I'm going to be incredibly late, I still don't see what the big deal is. I've got this one thing, one thing, and it's not that big. This is a waste of my time. Lady, like I said, I know you think this is all a big waste of time, but you can't take your baggage with you, so what are you going to do with it? I don't know. No. Oh, we try really hard um, Sunday mornings to make this a place where you could invite a friend, and um, you don't have to tell me this now, okay? So that's just kind of our goal is we always make this place, obviously we're worshiping God, we want to learn something, but this would be a place where you can invite a friend. And I've been wondering all week, um, for those of you who did invite a friend, and again, don't tell me this now, I have been wondering all week how that conversation went knowing that this is what we're going to talk about this Sunday. Is it like, you just go, hey, um, I've got a lot of friends. And at my church, we're talking about baggage. <laughs> and out of all my friends that I could invite, I knew you <laughs> needed to come. <laughs> out of everyone, you're the person who should join me this morning. Like, did it go like that? Or was it, maybe it's the other side that like, you completely forgot this is what we're going over this morning, and you had just told someone like, hey, you really should come, you really should be here. And then it comes out like, today we're talking about baggage. And your friend just kind of looks at you like, is this why? Is this here? Sorry, that's just in my head um, how things have been going. Uh, I need you to do something for me this morning. I need you to turn to your neighbor, someone around you, and I need you to say what I'm going to say, exactly how I'm going to say it. Turn to someone around you and go, you have got some baggage. Go ahead. <laughs> and now, if it was your spouse... I need you to say to them what you thought when they said that to you, which is, I know, but you've got more. Go ahead. <laughs> See, you laugh, but it's like, oh, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> That's why. Um, today, we are talking about baggage. I know you're excited. You're like, yes! The junk and the hurts and the scars and all that stuff from our past. Um, I have good news. Um, we're not just talking about baggage for one week. We're talking about your baggage for four weeks. Isn't that exciting? I can see it all over your faces. And uh, I guess this is the last part of the good news. Um, not only are we talking about baggage, we are talking about your baggage. You're thrilled. I can tell. This is exciting. Um, here's the thing. We all like to talk about baggage. The issue is, is that we would much rather talk about 
other people's baggage, <laughs> not mine. And uh, we like to play like psychologists from time to time, and we can diagnose people, and it's like, I wonder why they act like that. And then we go, I bet it was because this happened earlier in their lives. I bet that's why they respond how they do. And we go, you know what? I bet that's right. They do that. That is their baggage. That's how their baggage is affected. I mean, do we do that? Can we? Yeah, some of us do that. I mean, I do it. Not about you. Other people. <laughs> Don't worry, not about you. Uh, but we like talking about other people's baggage. Here's the, uh, here's the lie that we believe, though. Surely, if you'll bring that up. We believe this. We believe their past affects them, but our past doesn't affect us. Their past affects them, but our past doesn't affect us. We have no problem admitting that we have baggage. We have no problem saying, yeah, we've got baggage. But here's the thing is, we would go, yeah, but it, it doesn't affect me today. It's not that big of a deal. It's not changing who I am. And then we see it in other people and we go, oh my goodness, they are carrying this around and they are just an angry person or they are a bitter person or that's why they won't open up to anyone. And we can identify it and it's really clear to us like they've got baggage and this is how it's affecting them. And then when it comes to us, we go, yeah, but, but our baggage, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. It, it doesn't affect us. And so what happens in the long run is instead of actually stopping and dealing with our baggage, we end up doing one of two things. We either run from it or we hide behind it. Most common one is that we run from it. And we just kind of keep going and keep going. And whether it's something that happened a week, a month, or 30 years ago, we're just going... The, uh, yeah, I just don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. It doesn't affect me. If I just keep going, it won't be that big of a deal. Or the other one that we do, and this is a little less common, is we hide behind it. And that is when something comes up or we respond in a way that, honestly, it doesn't make us look that good, we'll kind of go, yeah, but you know, this happened to me. I mean, it's understandable that I do that because I've already been through this. Now, we usually don't say that out loud. We think it in our head, though. We go, yeah, but this is my excuse. I can respond like this. It's okay because I'm dealing with these things. And so the, in the long run, we never actually stop and deal with our baggage. And I think there's a couple different reasons why we don't do that. And I want to go through these real quick in terms of why we don't deal with our baggage. Um, first one is I don't think we know how it affects us. I mean, we see how it affects other people, but we go, I don't understand how much this is shaping me and how much this is changing me today. Another reason why this is a big one is we don't want others to think they could hurt us, right? I mean, we don't want to believe that others have that much control over us, that they could make us that angry or that they could make us that upset or that time would be spent thinking through hurts and scars from our past. We don't want to think that others, we want to think you know what? I, I control myself. I can handle this. Um, third reason is it feels like a step backwards. We always want to feel like we're moving forward and we're going ahead. And to deal with stuff from our past, no matter how short or long ago it was, it feels like we're no longer moving forward. We're going back to many years ago and dealing with that junk. And another reason that I've got why we don't deal with our baggage is it'd be painful. Right? <laughs> like no one wants to go, hey, when uh, you're, I, I, know, I know you're 60 now. But let's talk about when your teenage girlfriend broke up with you. Let's, let's have that conversation. No one goes, yes! Like, that's what I wanted to do today, because it'd be painful. But all in all, I think all these reasons come together for one clear one in terms of why we don't deal with our baggage. And here it is. Is we don't see how dealing with it can help us. Right? Because it is, I just want to keep moving forward. I just want to keep going. I want to keep going on. And, and how would going back through this pain and having these conversations and dealing with this stuff, how is that possibly going to help me today? How is that going to be a positive thing? No, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to stay busy. I'm going to go through life as I normally do because I don't want to deal with this stuff because it can have no impact. And so I want you to understand something. Um, this is the big idea for today and the big idea for this series. And so if you have to leave, if you're not here a week, you're going to get it all right here. Is that as long as you run from or hide behind your baggage, it will define who you are. It will change dramatically who you are as a person. But the second that you actually stop and you go, I'm going to deal with it. I'm not going to run from it anymore. I'm not going to make any more excuses. I'm not just going to keep myself busy. I'm actually going to stop and deal with it. The second that you stop and say, I'm going to deal with my baggage, whether it was from a year or 50 years ago, is the second that it no longer defines you, but it begins to shape your life in very, very positive ways. That the second that you stop and you go, I'm not going to run from it, I'm going to stop and I'm going to deal with it, 
is when your baggage no longer defines you, but it begins to shape your life in positive ways. And I want you to understand what this series is going to look like, because I mean, we all have baggage. Some of us, I'm not going to point fingers, don't nudge the person next to you. Some of us have more baggage than other people. I mean, it's, it's just fact. Um, in this series, we are not talking about their baggage, though. We're talking about your baggage. So you don't get to sit there and go, man, I wish so-and-so would hear this. Or like you look three rows over in the bleachers and like, are they listening? Because they really need to listen. I don't want to have that conversation again. Like somebody slide them a note to make sure they're listening. Okay, this is for you. And I want you to understand how this series is going to go. Um, today, we're not going really deep. And so if when you hear we're talking about baggage and you're getting all nervous and your hands are getting sweaty, you're like, are we going to talk about this? I don't want to talk about this. All right, we're not going that deep. Next week, we are going to go way deep into your baggage. And I just want you to know ahead of time, next week is going to be really hard, no matter where you stand, no matter what's going on. And so I don't want you to walk in here and get completely blindsided by that, because next week is going to be really hard. And then we're going to kind of work our way back up. Okay? So for today, I just want to get us all on the same page that every single one of us has baggage and it affects us. Now, our story today is going to be, if you have your Bible, whether it's in print or on your phone, it's going to be in uh, Genesis chapter 42. If you don't have either of those, the words are going to be on the screen. And today our story is going to be about Joseph. Now, when we pick up the story, Joseph is second in charge in the entire nation of Egypt, okay? So there is Pharaoh, and then Joseph is the next guy. He is like vice president of Egypt, except he actually has power and people care about him, for the analogy there. So, oh. <laughs> um, so that's where we pick up the story in terms of where Joseph is. So Joseph has significant power. But you need to know the backstory in terms of how Joseph got there. Joseph has got some baggage. Could we get Joseph's baggage out here? Thank you, Brandon. Do you guys get it? Because it's baggage. <laughs> you don't get it. I'll explain later. That's okay. You're slow. <laughs> so um, Joseph has got some baggage. I want to uh, go through real quickly what Joseph's baggage is. If he had a luggage tag, it would read like this. Hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, wrongly accused, and forgotten. This is how Joseph's story goes. Um, he has 11 other brothers, so he is one of 12 brothers, which is just crazy that they have that many brothers. Him and his other brother, Benjamin, are from the same mom. Rachel is their mom, and the rest come from different mothers. So his father uh, was a very busy man, <laughs> and so shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and so Joseph is there with his brother, and him and Benjamin are especially loved by his father. And here's the thing, is they tell all his other brothers that. Like Joseph says all the time, basically just the fact, hey, dad loves me more than the rest of you. And he does, and his father does nothing to hide it. Now, um, can we be clear, parents... Like, moment of honesty, pretend like your kids aren't around if they're with you. Like, you have a favorite, right? Right? You have a favorite. Me and Bethany have this conversation all the time. This she'll say, and this is Bethany, that's where I'm going to hold my belly. And she'll go, oh, I can't believe it's only eight more weeks until Emily gets here. And I'll say, I can't believe it's only eight more weeks till our second favorite child is here. <laughs> she gets really mad, but I'm serious. <laughs> Don't ever let Emily see this video. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it's fine. I'm just joking there. Hopefully you don't have real favorites like that. But Joseph was the favorite, and it was really obvious, and everyone knew it. And Joseph got special gifts and other things. And so his brothers hated him because of that. And they hated him so much that they actually formed a plot to kill him. They actually threw him in a well, and were planning on, out details on how they were going to murder their brother. Now, parents, no matter how much you feel like you are failing as a parent, just take comfort in the fact that your kids probably do not have an elaborate plan on how to murder each other. Like, they may get really mad, and they go, I'm going to kill you. Okay? But they're not actually like writing it down and getting details along the way. Okay? So you're still winning as a parent because this actually happened. And so they devise this plot to murder Joseph, and then they have this great idea. They go, hey, let's not murder him. Let's just sell him into slavery so we get some money for it. And so they sell him into slavery. They make it sound to their father as if their son is dead, as if his son uh, Joseph is dead. And so Joseph is sold into slavery, and he's taken off into Egypt. Okay? That's a fair amount of baggage already. 
hated by your brothers, and sold into slavery. And then he gets to Egypt, and he's working for this guy by the name of Potiphar. And the Bible says that Joseph is handsome, and he's smart, and he's strong. And Potiphar's wife really liked him. And so Potiphar's wife, one day when no one was around, threw herself at Joseph. And Joseph cared about Potiphar, and he knew what was right. And so he ran out of the room. And Potiphar's wife later on goes, hey, he went after me. Which was completely false. And so Potiphar is so upset by this, just heard that from his wife, that he takes Joseph and he throws him into prison. Fair amount of baggage. And so Joseph is now in prison for something that he has never done. And then there's this incredible sequence while he's there in prison. That these two prisoners who were servants of the king are thrown into prison and they each have a dream. And so they're talking about their dreams, and Joseph goes, Hey, I understand you've got these dreams. Why don't you tell them to me, and maybe I can interpret it. Maybe I'll pray to God, and maybe he'll give me the meaning of your dreams. And so the first guy goes, he goes, Well, okay, I'll tell you my dream. I had this dream, and blah, 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 and this and this happened. And Joseph goes, Well, this is what's going to happen. In three days, you're going to be restored back to your place, and you're going to be exactly where you were before. And the guy goes, Okay, that's great. And then the second guy shares his dream. You go, blah, 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 this and this and this happened. And I love, this is Joseph's response, okay? Like, all right, first, when you give someone bad news, I, I imagine you do a pretty decent job of having some tact in that situation. And like, doctors do this. They do a good job of this. Like, well, we got your test results back. And it's like, it's just kind of like the, oh, this is going to happen. Or it's like, hey. I just want you to know, and it's like, oh, this is good. or why don't you sit down? And so this guy shares his dream to Joseph, and Joseph's response is, he goes, well, this is what it means. You're going to die, and in three days, birds are going to eat you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> I like, there's, like, there's like, no, like, hey, I'm sorry. This, he goes, hey, you're going to die, and then birds are going to eat your dead body. Now, now back to you, as we're talking. And then he turns to the other guy and he goes, hey, when you get restored, will you remember me? Because I'm not supposed to be here. I didn't do anything wrong. And so it exactly happens. Guy gets restored, other guy dies, and then he completely forgets about Joseph. And so Joseph is now in prison for something that he has never done, and he is forgotten. And I just want you to look at his, what his luggage tag would be real quickly there. Hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, wrongly accused... And forgotten. And this is going to be important because you have probably had a lot that's happened to you in life. Or you probably have. But my guess is that you don't have more baggage than Joseph has. Because that's quite a bit that he's dealing with right there. That's a lot to handle. And it's going to be really important because he is actually going to stop and deal with his baggage. And so the story goes like this. Life goes on. Joseph is stuck in prison. And then Pharaoh, the king of the land, has a dream. And the guy who was his servant who was restored goes, wait a second, there was a guy who I was supposed to remember. That's right. He was in prison. And so they bring Joseph out of tr prison. Pharaoh tells Joseph his dream. Joseph prays. He gives Pharaoh the meaning for his dream. His dream was that for seven years there was going to be times of abundance in the land, the crops were going to be good, and then for the next seven years, there was going to be a famine in the land. And so he goes, hey, while you know this, you should store up all your crops and everything for those seven years. And so during the seven years of famine, you won't die, and you can sell it to other people, and then your land will become really, really rich and really, really great. And Pharaoh goes, um, do you want to do that? And he goes, sure. And so Joseph is second in the entire kingdom. Now, when we pick it up in Genesis 42, What's going to happen is they are two years into the famine and Joseph's brothers and his father, they're living in the land of Canaan, which is outside Egypt, and they hear that in Egypt there is food. And so they're going to come to Joseph. So this is how it reads. And we've got a lot of scripture to cover, so I'm going to read kind of fast. But I want to pause real quickly at the beginning. So this is Genesis 42, starting in verse 1. And it says this, When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? Don't you love that that's in the Bible? I mean, how many times as a parent have you said that? Like, stop staring at each other. <laughs> do something. <laughs> this room is a mess. Quit just looking at each other. And so that's actually biblical. You're quoting scripture when you say that. So you should do that. So, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. 
Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them. Pause real quickly here. One of the reasons why Joseph's brothers hated him wasn't just the fact that his father loved him more than them. He was very vocal about it. And in fact, um, Joseph had these dreams at one point in time that all his brothers would bow down to him. Now at this point in time, other than Benjamin, he is the youngest in his family. And he goes, hey guys, I had a funny dream last night. Which, I mean, you've probably had that story at the breakfast table with your kids. And it's like, oh, was it? And your kids are like, a panda was chasing me and I had to eat cereal. And he went away and it was great. And Joseph goes, hey guys, I had a dream last night. Okay, what was it? Well, um, you guys all bowed down to me. How about that? And they went, kill him now. Okay? So he remembers these dreams that they're going to bow down before him. It says, um, verse 9, then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. They thought Joseph at this point in time was dead. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. And it's important that we pause right here in the story. And I want you to see something. This is not the account of someone with a master plan. Okay? This is not Joseph forming his strategy on how he's going to deal with his brothers. Okay? That's not the case. This is someone who is angry. This is someone who thought that he had left his baggage of his family behind years and years ago. And all of a sudden it has come up and it has caught him. And he thought he was done with it. He thought he was never going to have to worry about his brothers or his father or any of this that had happened again. And all of a sudden, it's right there in front of him. Okay? So this is not Joseph being brilliant. This is Joseph, all of a sudden, his baggage is right there in front of him. And this is what I want you guys to see. That not only does Joseph have baggage, if we looked back at his luggage tag and all the things that it said along the way, that there is something inside him that has changed. And so if we were to actually go through and unpack Joseph's baggage, and this may be hard to read, but I just want you to see the metaphor. Joseph's baggage would be that he's angry and that he's vengeful. Real simply. He's angry and he's vengeful. Do you, uh, I want you to see it. You see that in the text, right? Okay. He's not cool, calm, and collected. He sees his brothers, and the only thing that he come up with is, you are spies. And then, and then how great would this be? He throws all his brothers in prison for three days. Like, that's a pretty sweet position to be in if you could actually do that. There you go. He's going, oh my goodness, all of a sudden it's caught up to me. And he's angry, and he's vengeful. Story goes on. Verse uh, 18. It says, on the third day, Joseph said to them, do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. Then they said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. 
We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben, his older brother, actually pleaded for them not to kill Joseph. It says, Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. And we go, wait a second. That's a funny response. I mean, we know the story, we know what happened in the past, but if this was just an everyday occurrence and somebody threw them in prison because he thought they were spies, and they said, you got to bring your brother back, I mean, I think the response would be, okay, I mean, this sucks, but let's go do that. That's what we need to do. But that's not their response. Their response is, oh, this must be happening because of what we did to Joseph. And that's when you realize something. Joseph isn't the only one in this story with baggage. Joseph's brothers have baggage. Brandon, would you bring us Joseph's brother's baggage? Now, I want you to see what Joseph's brother's baggage is as we go through it. Surely, if you bring that up. Here's their baggage. They were unloved by their father. They sold their brother as a slave, and they hurt their dad. I mean, they knew that their father didn't love them. And it was very obvious. And some of the statements that their father is going to make in the chapter ahead, really hard. I mean, you struggle if you thought your parents played favorites. Nothing like this. And they thought their father didn't love them so much that they were so upset that they sold their brother into slavery. Imagine if you have that hanging on you for your entire life. When he goes, well, ten of us are here. We were twelve brothers. One's with our father and one's no more. And they're going, yeah, we killed him. I mean, not directly, but we killed him. Imagine if you've got that hanging over you. And so much so that they said, yeah, they really hurt their dad. And he's going to make some statements up ahead that you'll see to the depth that he was hurt. And we go, wow, Joseph's not the only one here with baggage. You've got to think. Think if you're the brothers. I mean, you can tell from their interaction, this is probably the first conversation they had about this. And they thought they were past it. They thought that they had left it years ago. They thought, oh yeah, that thing with Joseph, but that's done. And then all of a sudden, it comes right before them. They went, wow, we can't run from it. It's going to get us. All of a sudden, they're dealing with the baggage from their past. Now, if we unpack the brother's baggage, this is what it actually looks like. Wrong zipper. There you go. The brothers are very obvious. They're shameful, and they're scared. They're embarrassed about what they've done, and they're scared about how their future is going to play out. This is the reason why I'm doing this. I want you to see this. is because we have a tendency to just chalk up our baggage, and we go, oh, yeah, this. But we don't realize how it shapes us on the inside. And we'll go, oh, yeah, 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 this years ago. But we never actually take the step, and we unpack it, and we go, this is how it's actually changed me. And so the story goes on. And so Joseph actually takes one of the brothers, he takes Simeon, and he binds him up. I don't know exactly what that looks like, whether it was ropes or handcuffs or what they used back then, but he binds him up in front of all the brothers, and he throws him into prison, and he sends him home. And as the brothers are on their way home, they find they open up their sacks of grain, and their silver that they had used to buy the grain was back in their sacks. And they're like, oh no, how did this happen? Joseph put it back in there for them. And so they get home, and they tell the story to their father, Jacob, Joseph's father. And they tell the story. They went, hey, we went here, and the governor of the land, he treated us really, really harshly, and he spoke to us, and he thought that we were spies, and he bound up Simeon, and he said, we've got to come back with Benjamin, otherwise Simeon's going to stay in prison. If we want any more grain, we don't have enough. We've got to bring Benjamin back. And I want you to see Joseph's father's response. This is Genesis 42, verse 36. It says, their father Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Uh, hold up. If you're a parent, and you hear, and this is really hard to put us in this situation, I understand that, but you hear one of your children are in prison, do you go, he's dead? You don't. You go, okay, how can we get him out? <laughs> Like, what can we do to help them? If you hear, hey, we're going to have to do this. All we have to do is send your youngest son, and this one's going to be out of prison. And he goes, he's dead. This is a crazy response. He continues. 
It says, then Reuben said to his father, you may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you and trust him to my care and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, my son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. He says to his other nine sons, I mean, feel that he's the only one left. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. <laughs> what do you do with that? It goes on. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. And we go, wow, that is a crazy response. Like, that's not how I would respond as a parent. I, I hope that's not how you would respond as a parent. We go, that just doesn't make sense. And then it dawns on you. You go, wait a second. Joseph and his brothers are not the only ones in the story dealing with baggage. Let's go ahead and have Joseph's father's baggage out here. I'm going to tell his very quickly. This is Joseph's father's baggage. His name is Jacob. He deceived someone. He was deceased, deceived. His wife died, and he lost his son. I want you to understand, uh, we've talked about this before, how in this day and age, they were given what's called an inheritance. The firstborn son got two-thirds of the inheritance. Jacob was not the firstborn son. His brother Esau was the firstborn son. Jacob's mom loved him more than she loved Esau. We're seeing a family trait being passed down. And so he gets Jacob to trick his father, who really couldn't see at the time, to give the birthright, to give the inheritance to Jacob. And so Jacob goes off and he's running from his brother because he tricked his father and he's got the birthright. And then he does this. And there is a moral to the story I want you to see real quickly here. He wants this girl by the name of Rachel as a wife. And so he goes to this guy by the name of Laban, who was her father, and he goes, I would like to take Rachel as my wife. And Laban goes, okay, you've got to work for me for seven years. And Jacob goes, no problem whatsoever. I can do that, which that would be an awesome system if we still had that today. He goes, no problem, seven years. And so he works for seven years. Rachel had an older sister named Leah. In that day and age, normally the older sister was married first. And so Jacob works for seven years. On his wedding day, he gets really, really drunk. And Laban pulls a little switcheroo. And he puts Leah in instead of Rachel. And Jacob wakes up the next morning and he goes, Who are you? Which is a note. Do not get drunk on your wedding day. <laughs> Say, you at least learned something this morning. <laughs> And so he wakes up and he goes, well, who's this? This is Leah. And he goes, I'm sorry. He goes, older daughter has to get married first. You've got to work another seven years for Rachel. So he does. So he tricks his father into the getting the inheritance. And then he's tricked and he's given the wrong wife. And then Rachel dies, who was the wife that he loved. And then later on, he believes his son Joseph was dead. Okay, this is a lot of baggage. And most of his baggage has to do with him tricking other people or him being tricked. And so it gets to this point in the story and he hears this guy goes, oh, you got to come in and you've got to just send Benjamin and then everything will be fine. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. I've done this before. You know, fool me once. Whatever, I'm just not doing it. <laughs> and that's how it goes. And we go, that's a strange response. And this is what I want you to see. Jacob's baggage dramatically affected him. I've got to figure out these zippers sometimes. There we go. And here's how it affected him. First of all, Jacob was extremely overprotective and he was afraid. He was overprotective and he was afraid. And this is the point in time in the story where as I'm reading through it, I go, okay, seriously, how long are we going to do this? Like, I mean, are there more suitcases somewhere? Like, are we going to bring them out for Jacob's dad and his dad and his dad and his grandfather? Which we could, because they all had baggage. We're kind of going, okay, how long are we going to roll out the suitcases and talk about the backstory? I really wish that we could have had like a sound effect when we said like, he's got baggage. And, like, and now Joseph has baggage. And we all went, wah, wah, wah. And so we can just kind of really feel that. But we didn't. And I don't know, as I'm reading through this, I go, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is a bad movie that's got nothing but twists. How long are we going to go through and just diagnose everyone's baggage? And that's my point. That's what I want you to see. Is because Joseph's got baggage, and he never dealt with it. 
And his brothers have baggage, and they never dealt with it. And his father has baggage. And his father has baggage. And they never dealt with it. And it goes on this continuous cycle that it keeps getting built up. And it keeps dynamically defining their lives and the person that they are because they keep running from it or they keep hiding behind it. Here's what I want you to see. One of the types of baggage that we're going to talk about in this series is generational. You have baggage that your parents passed on to you. You do. And here's the thing, is that you may sit there and you may think, I know it, mom and dad, I can't believe it. And at the exact same time, your kids are looking at you and they're going, mom and dad, I can't believe it. And unless if you actually stop and go, I want to deal with it, it's going to keep defining you. And here's the thing is that this story does not go on forever like this. Because Joseph is going to stop, and he's going to deal with his baggage. And he's going to confront it head on. And it stops the cycle. The story continues like this. Jacob does not want them to go to Egypt. And in fact, he forbids them to go. And so time goes on, and eventually they run out of food. And he goes, okay, go to Egypt. And they go, uh-uh, not without Benjamin. We're not doing that. And he fights with them for a while, and eventually he relents and he sends Benjamin. And so they go to Egypt, all the brothers. And Simeon's led out of prison, and they actually eat dinner with Joseph, and they still don't recognize him. They are not very observant. And so they eat dinner with Joseph, and then they get their grain, and they're on their way home. Before they leave, Joseph has one of his servants take his silver cup, which was his special cup, and he puts it in Benjamin's grain. And so they're on their way home thinking everything's fine, and all of a sudden, Joseph's soldiers surround them, and they go, hey, here's the deal. Our master, he's missing the silver cup, and we just have to check your grain to make sure it's not there. And so they check all of them, and then they get to Benjamin's, and they find it there. And the soldiers basically say this. They say, oh, you can go, but he's going to die. But, but go home. You're fine. And so they all go back to Joseph, and it's this incredible encounter. And um, this is in Genesis... 44, if you want to read it, I'm just going to tell it to you now. This is an incredible encounter where Joseph stands up in front of him and he goes, why have you pay, repaid me for my kindness like this? Because I was nice to you. I was kind to you. I fed you. And why have you repaid me like this? And he goes, your brother's going to be thrown into prison. I don't care. The rest of you can go home, but your brother's going to be thrown into prison. And then one of his brothers, Judah, he steps up and it's so incredible. And he stands there and he tells Joseph the whole story. Joseph knew the story, but he goes, hey, here's the deal. He goes, years and years ago, we had this other brother, and we hated him, and we sold him into slavery, and we told our father that he was dead, and it almost killed him. It almost killed him. He was so upset, and he was so hurt by what happened. And he goes, here's the deal. We can't lose him, because our father only cares about him, and he does not care about us, and we cannot lose him. So keep all of us. Throw us all in prison. And that's fine, but please just let him go home. And then Joseph gets to this point, and he goes, I'm not going to run from it anymore. I'm not going to hide behind it. I'm going to deal with it. And this is how that encounter goes. This is Genesis 45. It says this, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence, which I would say I would think so. Verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. I want you to see what's going to happen before we look at these last two verses of Joseph's speech. Because if you had had this conversation with Joseph beforehand, why are you here? This is the story he would have told you. Well, my brothers hated me, and they sold me into slavery, and I worked for this guy, and I was wrongfully accused and thrown into prison and forgotten, and by some miraculous thing, I was back here. He would tell a story of how his baggage had defined his life. If someone asked you, and they went, hey, why are you so overprotective? Why are you so scared? Why are you so afraid? You would tell that exact same story. 
It would go, well, this and this happened and this happened and I couldn't control this and this happened in my life. And that is how we respond when we're running from our baggage or hiding behind it. But Joseph is dealing with it. And so I want you to see how his response changes. It's verse 6. For two years now there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He goes, yeah, I understand you did all this, but it wasn't you. It was God. God was doing something bigger. This is the moment where Joseph's baggage no longer defines him. Because he's decided to deal with it, and so it begins to shape him in positive ways. And he goes, I understand that all this has happened, but you know what? It's going to be used for good. Now, now for some of you, you hear that, and you're going, I don't believe it. I don't see how that's possible. It would be really clear. Some of the baggage that we incur, um, we bring on ourselves. And we do stupid things, and we make bad choices. And so we bring that baggage on ourselves. Other types of baggage, we have no control over. If you're coming from a situation where you've been abused, you probably look at that and you go, there's nothing I could do about that. There's nothing I could do about that. And I have carried that with me for so long. And then you're probably going this. How could God use that for good? I mean, that's defined me. That's kept me from having close relationships for my entire life. How could God use that for good? Just understand something. Look at what Joseph is carrying. He was hated, sold into slavery, wrongfully accused, and forgotten. And he goes, but God was going to use it for good all along. And I know that's really hard, but I want you to understand that you've got to get to this moment. That your baggage, the things from your past, the scars and the hurts that you carry will define you your entire life until the moment that you go, I'm going to deal with it. By God's grace, I'm going to deal with it. And it is at that moment that he goes, I'm going to show you how I'm going to use this for positive. Did I bring this on you? No. Did I want this to happen? No. But I promise you, I'm going to use it for positive. And so this is how we're going to end this morning. Um, if you were pulled out um, at the end of the skit or during the skit, you got a luggage tag. Go ahead and get that in your hands. And I don't want you to do it now because um, we're nosy and your neighbor will be going, what are they writing? <laughs> Bet that's worse than mine. So don't do it now. But I want you to take some time today. And I want you to write down your name. And I want you to write down what that baggage is. What your luggage tag is. I, I don't want you to go into yet, how is it affecting me? Because we're going to get to that in the weeks ahead. But I just want you to simply go, okay, what is it? Maybe I brought it on myself. Maybe I had no control over it. But what is the baggage that I carry? Um, I've got a few questions, and we're going to put these on the blog. Um, so you can uh, just keep them so you don't have to worry about writing them down now. But these are just a few questions to help you get started on it. Um, first of all, what scars have I carried from past relationships? I think relationships are one of the greatest sources of baggage in our lives. And what scars have I carried? Maybe where was I hurt? Where did I hurt someone else? And I've kept that with me. Um, second question is what have I tried to let go of that I just can't? What have I tried to let go of that I just can't? The thing you go, I tried to forgive them, I tried to forget about it, I tried to move on, but it keeps coming back up. And I go, why am I still dealing with this? What have I tried to let go of that I just can't? Here's the third one, and I think this is the hardest one in terms of identifying your baggage. What am I afraid of or embarrassed to talk about from my past? What am I afraid of or embarrassed to talk about from my past? This is the thing when everyone's having the conversation in the group, and that certain subject comes up, and you just get really quiet. <laughs> or you just go, I don't even want to be around this. What am I afraid of or embarrassed to talk about from my past? And this is what I want you to see. Your 
not alone on this. Every single person in this room has baggage. We all have baggage. And even the most healthy looking, seeming, got it all together person, they've got baggage and it is affecting them today. But the difference is, is you have to decide, will I run from it, will I hide behind it, or will I actually stop and deal with it? And I want you to see at that moment, God is going to take the pain and the hurt from your past and he's going to use it to shape you in a positive way. If you never get to that point, your baggage will define you. Your baggage will change the person that you are, the person that you want to be. But if you actually say, I'm going to have the courage to deal with it, it's at that moment that God's going to use your baggage in a positive way. Um, what time is it? 56. Okay. Um, here's the deal. Next week, I didn't think we were going to have time to get it today, which we do not. Next week, I'll tell you about mine and the baggage that I carry with me. Because I want you to understand, you are not in this alone. But we'll get to that next week. Um, I'm going to pray for us in one second. But to send you out a little bit on a higher note, I want to show you a clip from the most theologically sound television show in the entire world, um, How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> and this is what they have to say on baggage. That stuff that happened to me, it was pretty rough. I'm, uh, I'm still getting over it. Let me help you with that. And just like that, kids, my baggage didn't seem quite so heavy anymore. You see, everyone's got some baggage. It's part of life. But like anything else, it's easier when someone gives you a hand with it. I just love it. I don't know if you can see it that far. There was one guy's suitcase and his baggage said Cubs fan. <laughs> if, if that's you, write it on the card and we'll help you get over it. <laughs> All righty, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the scenes that we can come here today and talk about this difficult subject. And Lord, I want to pray for one simple thing for every person here. Give each and every one of us the courage to deal with this. And this may have been something that happened as we walked in this morning. Or it could have been something that happened while we were five. And it feels like so long ago. But Lord, give us the courage to no longer run from it or hide behind it. Give us the courage to come face to face with it and say, I understand that this happened. I may have brought it on myself. I may have had no control over it. But I need to deal with it because it can no longer define my life. And so Lord, I ask that you give us clarity and that you give us courage as we go through this series and go through this process together. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for joining.